here is New York. Commuters give the city its tidal restlessness. Natives give it solidity and continuity. But the settlers give it passion. E.B. White would have described me as a settler. In fact, I became a New Yorker to pursue my passion for design. My name is Daniela Ohad. I'm here at the Elizabeth Collective, historic mansion in Midtown New York, where art and design live together, curated by Mazon Girard. Welcome to Spring Dialogues. In celebrating the 100th anniversary to the founding of the Bauhaus, we are devoting an episode to the famed and influential school. It was founded in 1919 by Walter Gropius by merging two existing schools in Weimar, Germany, and it was closed down just 14 years later when the Nazis came to power. It has since become a symbol of the freedom of the arts. While short-lived, its influence has been far-reaching, affecting the way we create, think, live, and teach today. It has been believed that the Bauhaus introduced new design principles to the world of printing and aimed to revolutionize graphic design. However, in his new book on legendary typographer Jan Schickold, Paul Sturton illustrates an entire different picture. Paul, hi. Hello, Congratulations Daniel. on your book and on the exhibition. Thank you. So you claim in the book that the leading figures of the new typography movement were in fact critical towards the Bauhaus, that they thought that the Bauhaus did not really support their efforts to revolutionize graphic design? Yes, that's true. People are often surprised to hear that. But there is a clear distinction or a gap that opens up in German graphic design during the 1920s. There were clearly interesting designers in the Bauhaus, but most of the really innovative design was happening outside by independent designers or people who were in the printing industry. And in fact, you're quite right, there was some hostility between the two groups. The Bauhaus was very innovative across a broad spectrum of different media and different design activities. But in graphic design, it was not a major center That's for innovation. That's so surprising. And, and I want to ask you about Jan Chikold. So you uh, published this very beautiful book. Thank you. Very beautiful. And um, Jan Chikold, who is not known to most people, um, but was enormously influential. Yeah. How? The reason Chickold is so important is that unlike many people in the Bauhaus who came to design through painting or sculpture or architecture, he had trained as a printer. He was a calligrapher and a typographer by trade. Is there anything that today we can experience on the street that really came from Chickold? Well, indirectly. Yes. Remember, he was writing in the 1920s and 30s. But the revolution that he helped to bring about during that period that gave us the formal language of modernist typography and modernist graphic design. So when we look at things like the signage in the New York subway, which is famously linked to Massimo Vignelli, it is ultimately derived from the new typography. And so many logos oh. of companies. Almost every major international company has a logo that to a greater or lesser extent finds its sources back in the 1920s. And his collection ended up at MoMA. How did this happen? Well, this is an interesting story, Daniela, because when he was first becoming interested in modern graphic design, it didn't really have a focus. It was very difficult to get a sense that this was actually a movement. So he began to write to designers all over Europe and the USSR. And he 
was exchanging examples of their work. And soon he had assembled a huge collection of modern print material. By the time of the Second World War, he was beginning to doubt whether modernist graphic design was the answer to all social problems. And so he began to sell off his collection. And in 1950, he was already quite friendly with Alfred H. Barr of the, of the Museum of Modern Art. So he offered the museum a large tranche of his artwork and his own designs, as well as this collection of, of works. He offered them about a thousand pieces and he said that this would cost $350. And the strange thing is that Alfred H. Barr wrote back to say he couldn't get together $350 to buy it. And to his eternal credit, Philip Johnson stepped forward and said, look, this is a really important collection. And he funded it. He bought it himself it's and cool. he gave it to the museum which employed him. most substantial expression of the type of architecture promoted by the Bauhaus was built in Tel Aviv during the 30s. It was known as the White City for the thousands of white, streamlined, pristine houses built along the coast of young Tel Aviv. In fact, this type of architecture was soon become synonymous with the Zionist settlement in Palestine, pre-state Israel. Architect Gil Evansur, how are you? Good, very good. Thank you me. were born in Israel. Yes, yes. And this architecture was political. Yes, yes. How so? Well, in many ways, um, the, you know, the social Zionist movement and uh, the ideals of the Bauhaus were a great fit because these ideals of the Bauhaus, the international style, promote um, a, new, a new order. And, you know, Tel Aviv was a blank canvas. It wasn't until 1984 with an exhibition at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art that was called the White City, that this architecture, which up until then was largely neglected, sparkled rediscoveries, sparkled interest. And later this exhibition traveled to New York. It also inspired UNESCO later to name Tel Aviv a World Heritage Site. Um, what about that legacy of white city that we can experience today if visiting Tel Aviv. As we speak, we also see the beautiful pictures, photographs of Eagle Gavze from his new book. So now, as you walk through the, um, uh, you know, to the heart of the white city, you can spot beautiful renovations and beautiful alterations. Um, you know, there is a program of preservations now that are um, supported by Tel Aviv uh, municipality that give uh, developers uh, additional air rights to build on top of this. And so, so talking about the air rights, right. you were a part of architects team. Talk about air rights. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Talking about the air rights, architects team that built I think probably the most successful example of the type of um, residential skyscrapers right. that you can see today in Tel Aviv, designed by Richard Meyer, white building. I can't think about anyone else that more would be a better fit for no. the white city than Richard Meyer. Richard Meyer is one of the greatest modernist architects and, you know, known for his white, beautiful buildings and like a kind of, uh, perfect proportions and uh, play of light. And I think um, retaining Richard Meyer and partners to do this tower is, was very natural. And I was fortunate to be part of it. Uh, I was like the Israeli Lyson. Uh, I was the Israeli guy who worked. We were a relatively small team. And I, I think what made this building so successful is that we tried to take all the qualities that our office can bring to the table, but still make it a building of its own place. Very well integrated into yeah. the white city, yeah, this white true. tower, um, probably more than in other places in the world.
notion of interior design was first defined in the 30s, emerging from concepts advanced at the Bauhaus. Interior designers started to reject the practice of decorating according to personal taste and rather looked for systematic formulas. In her new book, Mid-Century Modern Interiors, Lucinda Havenhand is exploring those concepts that came to shape mid-century interior design in America. Lucinda, thanks for being here. You constantly speak about two different disciplines, interior design and interior decor. So how are they different from one another? And one of the things that I didn't realize until I became an interior designer is that there was confusion, just as you were saying, about what it is we do as interior designers as compared to your interior decorators. Always confusion. Always confusion. And you gave the hint of it when you in the introduction, but you said rooted in the Bauhaus, right? And the Bauhaus was a modernist phenomena. And I think it's important to remember that interior design is a modern approach to how to create an interior. You have selected five design legends and showed how each one of them perceived the house as more than just a place to live in. How did you make this selection? I made the selection because I actually looked through periodicals, design magazines of that time period, tons of them, lots of them, to see who was being written about, who was being published, and who were the people that kept coming up to the top of the discussions. So we have uh, Russell and Mary Wright, uh, we have Ray and Charles Eames, we have Florence Knoll, we have Richard Neutra, and we have George Nelson. These, all these five legends, they were all enormously successful. Yes. And they all became tastemakers. Yes, I think so. In mid-century America. Yes, yes. And they all really are looked at today as those heroes of that period. Yes, and I think it's interesting because some of them, I think, actually became prominent, but then less appreciated. By the time Russell Wright retired, people were saying, oh, he is just you know, a control freak. This is, you know, he became very unpopular. Same with Richard Neutra, his approach to interiors, which is very therapeutic and about behavioral things, became kind of passe as they went into the 70s. So I think they're actually having some renewal. Of course, the Ray and Charles Eames never lost popularity, I think. Mid-century American design is enormously popular yes. now. You see it everywhere. You walk into furniture stores, you look at advertisements, you look at fashion. What do you think in it that makes us loving it that much today? I think it really has a, a quality which I call resonance. Resonance is like a feeling of the actual piece or interiors, and I think those, those successful mid-century modern were able to resonate to us that, hey, here's the Eames chair. Yes, it is beautiful to look at, but it also fits your body. You can actually see how your body's gonna fit in this chair, and you're kind of delighted by that, by that, you know, so you wanna go across the room and sit in that potato chip chair of the Eameses. Bauhaus has challenged conventions in education, introducing new methods in teaching the arts. Those methods have come to shape design education ever since. Marisa Bertolucci, design scholar, has a special connection to the Bauhaus and to its methods of teaching. Marisa, hi. Hi. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. So what is your connection to the Bauhaus? Well, my father studied at the Institute of Design back when it was called, I believe, the New Bauhaus with um, Moholy Naji. It completely transformed his life and several of his classmates became very close to the family and in fact Bob Cato, who became a famous graphic designer, introduced my parents so I, I am a true daughter of the Bauhaus. You are. Marissa, what exactly were these new methods in design education and how did they revolutionize education? Well, first we have to understand what was going on when um, 
the Bauhaus before it was founded. Basically, design art education up until then was based on the academy system, which was all about theory and about learning drawing and you know life drawing, not even life drawing, but drawing from like statues. It was all about learning how to um, be precise in, in your drawing skills. It was not about thinking. It was not about reimagining the world. And Walter Gropius, who was already a young um, idealistic architect, felt that in order to really create a, a system, a school of design and art, that could express, could create the kinds of talents necessary for this new world and to change the world so World War I, something like that kind of violent catastrophe would never happen again, you needed a whole new you know, system of learning. Walter Gropius wanted to create a school that was about creativity. So not to copy, but to not create to copy, something from within. But create from within. With the rise of the Nazis, many of the key figures in the Bauhaus left Germany and carried with them those educational methods elsewhere across the world. And one of the first institution to cement those new methods was Harvard. So Walter Gropius was the dean of the architecture school. He tried, but without success, what exactly happened at Harvard? Joseph Hudnut wanted Gropius to be head of the architecture school and modernize the teaching. Joseph Hudnut was, from, was a traditional architect. So while he believed it was important for students to be exposed to this modern way, this contemporary way of thinking about design, when it came down to it, when push came to shove, the methods of Gropius were just too extreme for Hudnut. I want to ask you about Steve Jobs. He was a design guru of our time. What did he learn from the Bauhaus? Steve Jobs was deeply informed by the spirit of the Bauhaus. And I think in particular, this notion of a unified art of completely conceiving an object, every detail of it, is very, and, and in a very minimal way, is very much what the Bauhaus was all about. So when you get any product from Apple and the whole beautiful way that it comes in that white box and it's all so sleek and it's almost Japanese in the way that everything is intricately taped together and everything, that is the Bauhaus. Steve Jobs was able to translate that at the very start of the digital revolution and see how you could inspire a whole new culture through technology. And, and that really demonstrates how everyone today, all of us, in some way, are, are children affected. children of the Bauhaus. Are children of the Bauhaus. Yes. Through its own exhibitions and projects, the Bauhaus promoted the taste for minimalist industrial interior design. Those concepts came to shape both interiors in housing projects and in luxurious homes, and became the forerunner to the interior design in the century to come. Marianne Egler, design expert and educator, studied the domestic culture of Weimar, Germany. Marianne, how are you? Very well, thank you, Daniela. So the new interior that was promoted at the Bauhaus became extremely influential, even to the way that we live today. What exactly was that new interior? The new interior, um, first of all, uh, consisted of uh, residential spaces, domestic interiors, using the open or free plan. Think, for example, a loft space of today. And the open plan, of course, allowed for the free flow of space, but more importantly, allowed the inhabitant to determine their own functional uses of the space. No longer was your home a collection of small, discrete rooms. 
And this open plan was made possible, and this is the second point we should make, through the use and the application of industrial materials and processes from industry applied to domestic architecture. Now, another important aspect we should think about in terms of the uh, modern interior, the new interior, was the emphasis on health and hygiene. Um, in uh, 1923, the Bauhaus put on its first public exhibition, and that exhibition included a model house titled The House on Horn. And in that house, if we go to the kitchen, we are seeing a kitchen that is designed like a laboratory. So that emphasis on healthy living uh, was very, very key. What I find mostly compelling is how those concepts that you just named, exactly the same concepts, were applied to both housing projects for the working class people in Germany and also to the very luxurious projects such as Villa Tugendhat, which I visited two years ago. Have you been there? I have been there, Danielle, and it's spectacular. And I want to ask you also about those concepts and about the concepts that the Bauhaus advanced regarding interior design. How have those concepts been carried to the way we live today? In terms of the influence of the new interior here in the United States, we should mention the legacy of Philip Johnson. Uh, American tastemaker, modern architect, and MoMA curator. Already in the 1930s, in 1930, Philip Johnson hired Mies and Lily Reich to redecorate his New York City apartment. And when Johnson moved to subsequent homes, he recreated Mies and Reich's design. But didn't hire Mies. <laughs> exactly. Did um, it on his own. Indeed. Um, and making it his own. Uh, Philip Johnson and subsequent curators at MoMA have uh, continued to celebrate the legacy of the Bauhaus and uh, the new interior right up to today. Um, in addition, I think we should look at the original philosophy of the Bauhaus. Um, first of all, the idea that uh, good design should be for everyone. And certainly today, if we look at uh, retailers like IKEA or Target or even Walmart, there is a, a new emphasis on good design. If we look at the promotion of good design uh, on the internet or through television, uh, social media, uh, modern design is really having a, a true renaissance. Thank you, Marianne. Thanks for enlightening this uh, chapter in the Bauhaus legacy. And thanks for tuning in. And until next time, remember, feed your taste. This episode was brought to you by Rego, a worldwide leader in the sale of fine design at auction.